This is going to continue the series on taking notes in your Bible. And we looked at Revelation chapter 1, and we ended up in verse 6. So verse 6, it says, And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Okay, that word kings. When you got saved, you probably didn't know this, but you became a future king. And you're a priest. So let's look at that word king. How are you going to become a king? It says in 2 Timothy 2.12. You need to write this down. 2 Timothy 2.12. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. So you're promised to reign as a king with the Lord Jesus Christ if you do some suffering for him in this life. And I mean suffering for the cause of Christ. Not just your average everyday suffering. Because lost people do that. I'm talking about suffering for the Lord. So that's 2 Timothy 2.12. And then another good verse. Revelation 20 and verse 6. Write that down next to the verse. It says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. For they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. So, it's re referring to the millennial kingdom, that one thousand year reign. What are you going to be doing during that time? If you suffered while you were here, you're going to be reigning with him. So you want to suffer for the Lord while you're here. Now another good one, Luke 19, 17. says, And he said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little, have thou authority over ten cities. So the better you do here for the Lord, with the right motive, the better your inheritance is going to be in the millennial kingdom. The more cities you're going to get. Okay, so that's that word kings. So it said he has made us to be kings and priests. So let's look at the word priests. And a couple good ones are both in 1 Peter chapter 2. The first one is 1 Peter 2, 5. It says, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Then 1 Peter 2, 9. But ye are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So you're a royal priesthood. You offer up spiritual sacrifices. All right, the next one. Glory. The word glory. To whom be glory and forever and ever. Amen. Glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So let's look at that word glory. Romans 11.36. It says, For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. So that word glory, who should get the glory? The Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what's going to happen. When he comes back on a white horse at the second coming, from then on out, he's going to be the one that gets the glory. For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. All right, now that word dominion from Revelation 1.6. Uh, Jude, verse 25. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. He's going to get that real soon. That glory and that dominion. He's going to get the earth. I mean, if you think about it, the earth is already his anyway. But then when he comes back on a white horse, he's going to sit on a throne. And the devil's going to be chained up in the bottomless pit. Now, Revelation 1-7. It says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. 
So clouds, that's a good one. Let's look at that word clouds. Matthew 24, 30. It says, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So when Jesus Christ comes back at the second coming, he's coming through the clouds. Somebody's going to look up and they're just going to see the Lord Jesus Christ and ten thousands of his saints on horses coming through the sky. You talk about freaking somebody out. Matthew twenty six sixty four, Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. So behold, he cometh with clouds. Joel 2, 2. It's a day of darkness and of gloominess. A day of clouds and of thick darkness. As the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there hath not ever been the like, neither shall there be any more after it, even of the year, even to the years of many generations. So it says a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness. I wonder if it's going to be a really dark, cloudy day for the people. Well, of course it is. They're going to look up. And they're going to see someone that's just about to, to run them over coming out of the sky. Zechariah 12.10. It says, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him, as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him, as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. So that will match that every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. Because when Jesus Christ comes back at the second coming, it says, And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. They're going to see the, the holes in his hands, and they're going to look on him whom they have pierced. All right, Revelation 1-7 says, And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. So let's look at that word. Matthew 14, or Matthew 13, 42 says, And shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. When people in hell are in hell, they're wailing. And when Jesus Christ comes back at the second coming, it says, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. They're going to be wailing, just like people in hell. Wailing and gnashing of teeth. So it says, all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Now let's look at that phrase, because of him. Matthew 27, 19. This is right before Jesus was crucified on the cross. It says, And when he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. You're going to find out there's a lot of things that are all because of him. John seven forty three. So there was a division among the people. Because of him. There's been many uh, friends leave you because of him. There's been many wives leave their husbands because of him. Many husbands leave their wives because of him. Ephesians 4.32 And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. So God forgave you. Because of him. It's because of him you get to go to heaven. It's because of him that you don't have to be in hell. It's because of him that you don't have to live a life of sin. Now let's look at that phrase, I am. From Revelation 1.8. It says, I am Alpha and Omega. Okay, I'm going to show you some I am's of Jesus. He said, I am Alpha and Omega. Now in John 6... 35, it says, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. 
He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. John 8, 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. John eight fifty eight, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. John ten seven. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. John ten eleven. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. John fourteen six. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John eleven twenty five. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. John fifteen one. I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Revelation one eighteen. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive. Forevermore, amen, have the keys of hell and of death. So those are some I am's for you to write down. John 6, 35, John 8, 12, John 8, 58, John 10, 7, John 10, 11, John 14, 6, John 11, 25, John 15, 1, Revelation 1, 18. Now, let's look at the phrase Alpha and Omega. Here's three, I won't read these, but three you can write down for Alpha and Omega is Revelation 111, 21, 6, and 22, 13. <clears throat> All right, in the beginning, the phrase, uh, well, it's, he says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. So the beginning, the phrase, the beginning. John 1, 1 through 3, says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. So he, Jesus Christ did not just start in a manger. He's always been here and always will be. He is from the beginning. Genesis 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Jesus Christ was here when God created the earth, because Jesus Christ is God, and Jesus Christ is God manifested in the flesh. And John 1, 1 through 3, Genesis 1, 1 through 3, shows that he was here in the beginning, and then Colossians 1, 15 through 18. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So that's the beginning. And he's the end. He's the beginning and the ending. And he's the almighty. Let's look at that almighty. Job 5.17 Behold, happy is the man whom God correcteth. Therefore despise not thou the chastening of the almighty. Jesus Christ is that almighty God that chastens you. Job 27.10 Will he delight himself in the almighty? Will he always call upon God? Showing you the almighty is God there. Job 33.4 The spirit of God hath made me, and the breath of the almighty hath given me life. Plainly showing you the almighty is God, and the book of Revelation Jesus himself calls himself almighty. Okay, now, Revelation 1, 9. It says, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. All right, let's look at that word brother. John calls himself your brother. 
Colossians 4, 7 talks about another brother. It says, All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. John also is your brother in the Lord. Any, any person that's born again, they're your brother in the Lord. If, if it's a woman, it's your sister in the Lord. And John, that wrote this, uh, Revelation, John the Apostle, he is your brother. All right, the companion. He said, also, I'm your companion in tribulation. Psalms 119.63 says, I am a companion of all them that fear thee and of them that keep thy precepts. So John is a good companion. Uh, anybody who fears God and keeps his precepts is a good companion, a good person to hang around and to be friends with. All right, tribulation. That word tribulation, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation. Let's look at that word, Matthew 24, 21. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. So note, you'll notice this word is not an actual title for the time period, even though so many times we call it the tribulation. It's actually just a description of that future time period. Matthew 24, 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. So you can see, once again, it's a description after the tribulation of those days, not just after the tribulation time period. Mark 13, 24, 26, but in those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened. And the moon shall not give her light, and the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. John sixteen thirty three, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. But be a good cheer, I have overcome the world. There are Christians going through tribulation right now as I'm speaking. But we're not going through the tribulation, that future time period. Christians, saints have always suffered tribulation. But we're not going through that time period, the time of Jacob's trouble, you see. So that's tribulation. Now, Isle of Patmos. John says he is on the Isle of Patmos. In verse 9, he said was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So John is being persecuted. He's on the isle of Patmos. In Matthew 5, 11 through 12, it says, Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So John was persecuted and he was put in the exile on the Isle of Patmos. John fifteen twenty. Remember the word that I said unto you, The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. So if they persecuted Jesus and took him and put him in prison, they're going to put you in prison eventually. John sixteen thirty three. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So you're going to have tribulation in this life. You're going to have persecution. All that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So John is on the Isle of Patmos. He's being persecuted. For what reason? The word of God. Let's look at the word of God, that phrase. Proverbs 30 and verse 5. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Acts 4.31. And when they had prayed, 
The place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. That's what John did. John had the word of God. He was filled with the Holy Ghost and was able to speak the word of God with boldness, and that's what got put him on the Isle of Patmos. He knew that every word of God is pure, according to Proverbs 30 and verse 5, and that he is a, and the Lord is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. So he wasn't afraid to do these things. Or if he was afraid, he had courage in the face of fear. Philippians 1, 13 through 14 talks about, is the Apostle Paul talking about how people uh, got a lot more confident because of him going to prison for the word. Philippians 1, 13 through 14, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident by my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So I'm sure John being on the Isle of Patmos, exiled there, that gave many of the brethren confidence to just go ahead and preach the word without fear. If he can do it, they can do it. Now, the word vo the vo voice, let's look at that. In Revelation 1.10, it says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Before we do that, let's look at in the Spirit. Let's look at that phrase, in the Spirit. He said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. So the first one we can look at is Joel 1, or let's see. In the Spirit. Yeah, let's look at in the Spirit first. Ezekiel 37.1. How can you find out what in the Spirit means? Ezekiel 37.1. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones. So when Ezekiel is in the Spirit, he's carried somewhere else. Okay, now let's look at Acts 8.39. In Acts 8.39, it says, And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. So the Spirit took Philip, caught him away, led him somewhere else. He was in the Spirit. All right, another one. Revelation 17.3. Now, I believe this is what really explains it here. Since this is John, and it's in the book of Revelation, and it says the same phrase, in the Spirit. So I believe this will really show us what in the Spirit means. Revelation 17.3. So he carried me away in the Spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So when John is in the Spirit... He's being carried somewhere else, particularly here in the future. He's being, the Lord is picking him up and carrying him somewhere in the future. Now another one, Revelation 21.10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. So, they're picked up uh, and carried somewhere else. Be a lot better than any ride you've ever been on if you was able to do that, like Ezekiel and Philip and John. Now, the Lord, uh, he said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. And this is the only place in the Bible that actually says Lord's Day. And if we commonly use that today to talk about Sunday. You know, we say Sunday is the Lord's Day. But really, according to the Bible, you won't find that in there. That's just what we say. And the closest thing you can get to the Lord's Day is the Day of the Lord. So if John was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, then that means God picked him up, took him forward, 
and shown him the day of the Lord, the Lord's day. And what's the context that we've been reading so far? It's what he saw when uh, God picked him up and took him forward. You know, he saw the second coming. Remember we just read, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. That's the context. Is the day of the Lord, the Lord's day. And that's as close as you can get to finding what, what the Lord's day is unless you just kind of speculate on it. But here's some verses for the Lord's day. Joel one fifteen. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord as, is at hand, and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. So the Lord's day, the day of the Lord, that's most likely referring to the same time. Now Joel 2.31 in Joel 2.31, it says, The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and terrible day of the Lord come. So the Lord's day is most likely the day of the Lord. John was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. You see how we just compared Scripture with Scripture to get the answer. I mean, you can speculate a lot on in the Spirit on the Lord's day. But until you find out what the Bible says about it, you won't know for sure. And maybe you still don't know for sure, and that's fine. But the voice, let's look at it, it says, And heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. There's a lot of verses about God's voice. And I'm just going to go ahead and give you some of the verses, and you can write down and look these up on your own. Genesis 3.8, Psalms 18.13, Psalms 29.3-9, Psalms 68.33, Ezekiel one twenty four and Ezekiel ten five. You're gonna see in the Bible, God's voice is like thunder. God's voice is like many waters. God's voice is like a trumpet. And that's the voice you're gonna hear one day when he comes to get you in the rapture and says, Come up hither. And that's the voice that you're gonna hear at the judgment seat of Christ. The Lord's voice. But this has been Revelation chapter 1, 6 through 10. And I hope that you'll get these references down in your Bible and continue making your own reference Bible.